Hey, good morning everyone, TrackMan44 here. Hey, on that last video, remember we talked a little bit about coming down uh, memory lane by looking at all them old thermostats and some of those old furnace name tags and everything? Well, come along with me this morning. Let's go down to your grandpa's basement. Of course, there's probably some of you guys who remember these from your own, uh, your own childhood, you know, in your own mom and dad's basement. If so, just count yourself among the lucky ones. We talked about Winkler in that other video. Winkler um, is, is a pretty well-known name, you know, in uh, coal stokers or in the coal-fired furnace. Uh, business um, and origin. I can't remember when they made the very first one, but I would say it was probably be in the in the 1920s, and it was probably a, a gravity furnace. In other words, it just generated the heat and it would just radiate up through the house. You know what I mean? With no uh, no forced air or anything like that. Uh, that was that was typical of large round duct work and everything. You know, and asbest asbestos wrapped paper for insulation around them, and that would always have a great big monstrous return air grill and about a 24 inch round return air drop that went down to the bottom of this great big old monstrous furnace down in the basement. There was a wide variety of the way stokers would operate. Some of them were actually automatic. The newer ones were automatic stokers to where you just had to keep the coal bin filled and then pick out clinkers every so often, you know what I mean, with those funny looking long handled forks. They were a three tine fork. When you would squeeze the handle, it would open up the tines and you could fare it in and pick out the clinkers and then the fingers would pick it up, you just go ahead and put them in a bucket, take them out in the driveway or whatever it is you did with them. But at any rate, you'd only have to uh, keep the coal bin filled and, uh, and get the clinkers pulled out every so often. Um, once you lit it and ignited it, you know it would go ahead and do its own thing and would do it all automatically. But there was things you'd have to do to adjust the rate of flow or the rate of flow of coal into the uh, stoker burner. And we're going to look at one of those, one of those uh, things right here right now. Now this is the only parts and pieces that uh, that we still had over at my much older brother's house of the very last coal stoker, you know, that uh, that that I tore out, and this would have been way back in the in the 70s or so. There's a lot of parts and pieces missing. The auger that actually takes the coal right on into the to the burner and everything that's actually missing. My uh, my old, much older brother had to rob that auger out of there and then make a uh, make a homemade auger of sorts for a buddy of his to uh, auger underneath you know, a, a, a driveway or underneath a, uh, a sidewalk to get some electric or some water lines or something like that through. So we took the auger off of it. But anyway, this is pretty typical right here of, of one of the automatic ones. This here, of course, has a motor. This is a replaced uh, Dayton third horse. It didn't have to be anywhere near that because all it really does is turn a gear reduction inside and uh, a ratcheting mechanism. And then this small blower right here, this blower is nothing more than combustion air. You see this discharge area right here that my finger's on. That discharge area blew right in to the furnace, into the bottom of the furnace, and right up underneath the coal, and that's what actually uh, created the uh, or kept the coal burning. And this square drive right here is the portion where uh, an auger, two and a half to three, three and a half inches in diameter, and whatever length the 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 gun assembly was, it would actually attach to this guy right here. Of course, you see the flange and all that uh, that held everything in place, and this inserted inside the stove. Now I got to kind of clarify one thing. Whenever I say I worked on these things. What I really did is actually tore them out because uh, when I got into uh, HVAC in the in the mid 70s, there was a big push on you know uh, modernizing equipment, and everything like that. Even though fuel was real real inexpensive back then, it was still the thing to do because central air conditioning was really coming of age, and so a lot of these old gravity furnaces, you know, was very difficult to convert to uh, to central air simply because they were gravity with maybe a blower added if you were lucky. For the most part, you know, we would just rip those old things out and everything, you know, we'd put a, a standard furnace in there, a nice conventional style furnace that you see today, you know, and go ahead and make all new ductwork, do away with all the, uh, the all the silly gravity round ductwork and all that, just throw all that stuff away, and cut new floor registers in the outside perimeter because typically the gravity ones actually went right up to the inside walls, and uh, the houses typically were of, of, a, of a design, especially the smaller ones, where you would just literally raise that heat right up off of it and into individual rooms and then there would be a two large return airs at the side that that air would of the side of the rooms like living rooms or whatever to where that that air would circulate to the outside walls and drop down because the cold air would drop in front of those windows and then take the the warm air that's inside your house right along with it right down the return air drop carry it across the floor planning panning and then down the big 24 inch return back to the gravity furnace, you know, to be reheated again and then sent right back up to the center room. So that was the air circulation by natural convection or whatever you want to call it. But at any rate, that's neither here nor there. We converted all those to standard pressurized, uh, pressurized systems. 
uh, with standard furnaces that are still available today, very similar to what's available today. So let's take a look at how this thing actually made it automatic an automatic feed. Remember, we talked about that square drive up front on the auger. So when I turn this on, this belt drive is going to go ahead and turn a shaft right across here that's going to go to the combustion air. This is going to be your combustion air adjustment right here. It's got a lock nut here, a wing nut, and you spin that whatever direction you needed to do to get the right amount of combustion air to get the fire that you needed inside that furnace and everything. But at the same time, it would go in here and it would worm drive a gear reduction inside here that operates a pawl or a ratcheting mechanism. And in turn, this will begin rotating, but it rotates at the rate of whatever speed the uh, the gearbox is in back in the back. So let's take a look. Right now I've got it in neutral, so when I turn it on, it's just going to sit here and run. Combustion air fan's running. All right, this shaft is going, but nothing's turning right here. Keep an eye on that shaft, and I'm going to engage it or put it in gear. See, it indexes, stops, turns, and stops, turns, and stops. And this is on high speed right here. So I'm going to drop it down to a lower speed. This is actually a three-speed gearbox. Look at how such a sharp distance that it would turn. See how slow it's going now? So on mild days or a small house where you didn't really need to burn a bunch of coal, combustion air is going to be throttled down to almost nothing. And this guy's going to be running in the slowest gear possible just to give a minimum amount of coal into the, uh, into the burner compartment. So let's go back and take a look and see what's happening inside this uh, inside this box here. So sitting back here on the back side, you can actually see all the components and stuff going inside there. I've taken the inspection cover off that's laying over here. But if you listen, you see I've got it in third, third speed or the highest gear right here. And so you can see this ratchet go forward and you hear a paw clicking. Listen real close, you hear a click, click, click. And it catches three or four gears and rotates it and makes it turn really fast. So when I pull this, push this in and put it up in second gear, it's engaging less teeth per stroke. Or put it up here in low gear, now it's only engaging one, maybe only one teeth, tooth per stroke. And that's how it increases or decreases the rotation. You can see this guy right here, if I take this cap off, See how slow it's rotating in this speed here? We'll go back, I'll head back up in the high gear. Now you can see how much faster because it's grabbing more teeth on that pawl inside there. So sometimes you have to remember with anything mechanical, you know, there's going to be uh, issues or problems. Now occasionally, you know, you would kind of get a, a clinker build up and the coal would stop going through the auger. And so what you would have to do is you'd have to clear that. Well, you don't want to have to pull that entire heavy gun assembly out because this thing right here weighs about 60 pounds by itself. You know, and then of course you have the big long gun uh, in addition to that and the tube and everything's got the uh, auger on it. So what you would do, you go ahead and take this cup off here so that you don't have to remove it. And you can put a crescent wrench on this right here and you can, or a 12 point socket, and you can actually rotate this and you can force coal through and into that clinker and push that clinker right up into the firebox. You can remove it then with your clinker tool and then go ahead and uh, clear out the rest of the debris and go ahead and re reestablish the, uh, the coal fire and then go ahead uh, about your business. Everything's taken care of. But that's why you've got this drive back here on the back side accessible underneath this guy right here. In the 50s, as you kind of got away from coal, they, got, they did that simply because coal was just so nasty, you know, it's just so much coal dust and stuff inside your house. Uh, the ladies couldn't hardly hang their clothes up down in the basement or anything, you know, because of the coal dust, things of that nature. Uh, but at any rate, natural gas became, started becoming much more readily available, you know, in the outer areas of the city limits and then also in the incorporated areas beyond the city limits and then also rurally is the same thing out here in the country. They started running more natural gas pipelines and of course there was LP gas there as well. But uh, as natural gas was the, the main conversions that we would do because I worked mostly in the city, you know, um, in, in my early years of HVAC. And so what we would end up doing, we'd come into these, uh, in these places and they'd want to upgrade, you know, uh, doing completely away with the coal. So we would pull these assemblies out and there's a, a hole in the very front of the furnace, you know, where these things would actually have that, that um, this uh, auger and that auger tube, you know, inserted in. And so what we would do is we would go ahead and pull that out and then we'd insert whatever whatever adaptions we would have to make, whether they have to destroy or, or just tear out whatever we needed to tear out. It was okay because we would be installing our own in-shot burner, which is a natural gas burner that would typically 
typically go in and right on the end of the, the burner tube would be a dispersion plate, I guess, or whatever you want to call it, where that flame would hit that plate and then fire out in a radial direction like this, vertically. Or you had an upshot burner that went in and turned up, and then there was a plate that actually inserted in the very top of it to where that gas would come in, it would ignite, it would burn up against this plate, and it would go out in a radial pattern horizontally. So you had your end shot that, dis that uh, distributed the flame vertically in a radial pattern. It wasn't quite as efficient, in my estimation, as the one that was an upshot, which did it horizontally, okay, and heated all X sections fairly evenly, you know, of the, uh, of the firebox. So whenever we would put the replacement burner in, we would have to mix cement and, uh, you know, like topping mix or whatever, you know, and we'd mix gravel with it, whatever, you know, and we would actually fill in the base of that doggone burner uh, around where the old coal stoker was uh, and, you know, for the new gas appliance, you know, to sit in there. And, man, we did those things just continuously. I mean, it was just unbelievable how many of them that I got the opportunity to do. And then, of course, you know, it was just a, a few short years later, and uh, the big, big push then was to get rid of the old inefficient, big old massive, big old tank, cast iron tank type uh, heating units, whether they were coal, natural gas, or whatever, fired, and put in the conventional furnaces that we just talked about a little bit ago. So uh, at any rate, that's just a little bit about the, uh, the way the industry has changed in just what little time I've been uh, involved in it, and that's right at 50 years, you know what I mean? So uh, it's, it's really done a, a, a tremendous change, and it's going to continue to change more because now we have the furnaces that are just so ridiculously efficient. And I, I remember it was really hilarious way back in the day. These people had been in this house for 40 years, 50 years, in this big old massive furnace, you know. It's as big as I am or tight, tall as I am and, and, you know, five or six foot in diameter, you know. And we'd come in there with a sledgehammer. We'd knock that stuff out, you know. We'd be, have the area cleared out in no time. And here we come back in with this little video square box about 22 inches squared, stood about 50 inches tall, you know what I mean, and placed it in the front. And so many times the homeowners would come downstairs and say, well, I tell you, I don't know what we've done. No, there's no way that little old box is going to heat what our big old furnace did. I just know we're not going to be satisfied. And so you'd have to spend some time, you know, and kind of explain to them, you know, the way they transfer the heat is just so much better, you know, in these conventional furnaces because you don't have this massive cast iron to heat up. It's not such a phenomenal recovery time if your furnace is out and uh, gets cold in the house. All that cast iron, you know, has to be reheated up to a, a pretty pretty good level in order for it to start rejecting heat, you know, to the air going around it. Whereas the newer furnaces, you know, they were uh, there was a, a thin metal that transferred that temperature really, really well. But, again, efficiency has its price, just like I talked about before in the thermostat video. The, uh, the cast iron, some of those cast iron burners are still out there. Cast iron furnaces are still out there this day and time, still running inefficiently as all get out, probably 35 to 40 percent efficiency rating. But you know what? They're still out there working with uh, 100 year old components and parts and pieces, you know, or maybe even 50 or 60 year old replacement parts. But they're just Cadillac along just every single day, you know what I mean? And uh, there still is some of them out there. Fortunately for me, you know, not too many of them. Of course, I didn't really mind working on them because there was some really unique way they control stuff. I remember these old uh, uh, Honeywell gas valves. They were a 24 volt motor and it had a nice neat can like a like a uh, like a glass can that you would see on top of those fancy clocks. I think they call them eight day clock. But anyway, this uh, it wasn't a clock. This was a metal can or a dome. And you there's a thumb screw at the top. You pull that and slide this dome off the top of it. And there exposed the 24 volt clock motor or gear motor. And there was two big old bull gears. I mean, there'd be two bull gears, probably three three and a half inches in diameter. And that clock motor, whenever thermostat would call for heat, and you had a standing pilot through a beacock, so there's always a, a live flame inside the burner, and it would go through what's called a basal switch. So, you know, if the basal switch had fallen out because the pilot had extinguished, the, it wouldn't allow this to open up because that's wired in series with the thermostat. But at any rate, but thermostat would call for heat, pilot lights lit, and you could hear that whole gas valve. It would just just start grinding, you know, literally just a grinder, like that, really, really slow. And they would lift this big old solenoid valve or this big old valve off of the, the, <laughs> the off of the seat inside the gas line, and you could hear the gas start whooshing in. 
And you would hope, you would just hope and pray, oh boy, you better hear some ignition before too long because it's letting off a powerful lot of gas in there. But then again, the pilot flames were big old tall flames in two directions, and some of the big furnaces may have three pilot assemblies in them. You see what I mean? Especially the boilers that are just massive in some cases. But anyway, you'd, you'd breathe a sigh of relief whenever you would hear that thing go ahead and get its ignition, and then the gas valve would continue opening, and by that time you can look in the inspection door, and you can see that flame as it ignites, you can see it be so big, and then as it opens, you can just see it get just bigger and bigger and bigger until it's finally done, uh, you know, all the way at full capacity. Then it would heat and heat until the thermostat was satisfied, thermostat satisfied, you could hear it cut the power to the, the spring return gear motor on the geared gas valve, and you would hear it just really, really rapidly go rawr, 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 like that, and it would slam shut on that seat, and then poof, the flames just go completely out. Look back inside the furnace, make sure, and you'd see your pilot flame or pilot flames in there. Everything's copacetic, everything is good and cool. And so that's the way those old systems work, and I really thoroughly enjoyed working on them. All there was was a limit switch on them, you know, for uh, over temperature. And there was a, if it was a fan powered uh, unit that had hot air, there would be a fan cycling control that would turn the, turn the blower on and off automatically based on temperature. The, the, the old gravity ones did not have them. So at any rate, that's just a little bit of the changes that I've seen. I could probably talk, I could probably talk for a week and never repeat myself. Of course, I'd probably repeat myself. But at any rate, it just, it just unique the way everybody's industry, no matter what it is, what they've been involved in, has changed has has morphed from the time they started them or we started our careers, you know, just 50 short years ago up until we retired, you know what I mean? It's just absolutely incredible. I think if I was going to make a suggestion for youth, I think I would make a suggestion to for you to try to stop and think about what kind of job you want to do that cannot be replaced by a machine. Now, you can't tell me that there's a robot that's uh, going to come out here and tear out one of these old furnaces and all that stuff and uh, carry stuff out of the basement, uh, measure up some sheet metal, run back to the shop, make up, fabricate some sheet metal, and come back and install it. You ain't going to tell me that there's one I'm going to be able to do that. Uh, so at any rate, that's just my, my tip or my hint. I uh, have no idea, would not recommend that you follow in my shoes, you know, because uh, I've been there and done that. You know, it's kind of tough and sometimes, but other times it's very rewarding. That's about all I got to say. I know I just carried on and rambled on entirely too much probably end up editing a whole lot of this stuff out of there, but I just thought maybe you might like to hear what some of the silly things were that we contended with and some of the old stuff was that we worked on in, in HVAC, you know, back 50 years or so. So, hey, you know what, guys? I hope you enjoyed that, and this is Tractor Man 44, and uh, I'm out of here, guys. <laughs>